Good morning. It is uh, Friday, March 31st, if you can believe that. I believe that is the last day of March, if, if my calendar is right. Uh, it's March 31st. Uh, it is uh, 8.40 in the morning, uh, and I am calling together into order the State and Local Government and Veterans Affairs Committee. A quorum is present. Uh, today we're going to take... Uh, testimony and do a walkthrough of the state and local government uh, omnibus bill, the budget bill. I'm glad you're all here today. Uh, and before we get started with that, I just want to make sure uh, we have uh, done the work to make sure we know who is with us virtually today because we do have a couple of virtual members. So those who are uh, with us virtually, if you can turn on your cameras and let us know where you're at, um, we'd be grateful. Good morning, Senator Morrison. Good morning, Madam Chair. Minneapolis. Good morning, Senator Draskowski. Good morning, Madam Chair. Uh, Draskowski, Winona, Minnesota. Thank you. I know Senator Barr is going to be with us virtually today, and I understand he's having some technical difficulties. So when he is with us, we will we will acknowledge where he's at. Uh, and we're glad that you're going to be with us, Senator Barr. As soon as you're with us, click on your camera and we will proceed. Uh, and with that, we're going to get started with our work. It is a busy Friday here in the, in the Minnesota Senate. I, I do say, I want to say before I go over to the table to present uh, the start of this bill, uh, we are going to wrap this, this bill up on Monday. So we will be back on Monday to, um, as they say, mark up the bill, which really means that we will debate it, take amendments, and vote it out of the committee on Monday ahead of the Tuesday deadline, uh, where these bills have to be sent to the Committee on Finance, and that's where this bill is going. Um, I want to make sure before uh, I, I leave this spot to say that this will not be the last meeting of this committee. And uh, I know some of the committees, as they're wrapping up their work, are uh, signing off mostly for the term. But we do have some late bills that are going to come through this committee because of our jurisdiction on rules and working groups. And there are a couple more confirmations that we have to tackle. So we will be back together again, which I suppose means we just have to continue to be really kind to one another um, as we work our way through this, because uh, we'll be facing with, the, with one another again. Uh, and with that, Senator Mitchell. Okay, it looks like Senator Murphy is settled, or a little bit. <laughs> Welcome to the testifier seat. And would you like to present your bill, please? Thank you, Madam Chair and members. I, uh, I, I think I took a piece of the document that you need, so I'm going to leave this right over here for Teresa. Um, and uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair and members. Uh, I am here today to talk with you about Senate File 1426, uh, which will, uh, as we put together the pieces, become uh, the state and local government omnibus bill. Um, this is a piece of work that reflects uh, now months of work by this committee. And I will say that this is a very hardworking committee. Um, I knew when, uh, when we came together at the start of this term that we would be uh, dealing with a broad jurisdiction and a variety of issues. Uh, we've already passed our policy omnibus bill through, uh, and yesterday we did the veterans omnibus bill, uh, which was a sweet moment, especially because there were so many veterans uh, in the Capitol yesterday. Um, and today we take the last step of that work and we move out. Uh, well, we won't move today, but we are beginning the process of uh, moving 
uh, the, the, the omnibus bill that will fund our state and local government. Uh, so I will move for you before I talk about the bill, Senate file 1426, so it is before the committee. And I do have um, a couple of amendments to put the bill into the order um, that I'd like it. Uh, and the first is the A4 amendment, which is uh, a delete everything amendment. Uh, so this encompasses the things that uh, represent the work of this committee. Um, and Madam Chair, I would love it to move the A4 amendment. Okay. Senator Murphy moves to adopt the A4 amendment. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? And the A4 amendment is adopted. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I believe I have one more technical amendment. It's essentially a technical amendment, the A5 amendment. Uh, and this is just incorporating uh, a couple of changes coming from uh, the administration um, that were missed as we wrote the initial bill. So this is one more step, an author's amendment, to get the bill into the shape um, that we'd like it. And so I, Madam Chair, respectfully move the A5 amendment. Okay, Senator Murphy moves to um, amend the A4 with the A5 and adopt the A4 amendment as amended, basically. Okay, so we move to adopt the A5. All in favor? Say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, the A5 is adopted. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. I have been thinking a lot about uh, this proposal and the work of our committee and our, our objectives, the things that we share together and the things where we differ. Uh, and I think this bill is a representation of all of that. Uh, this is a proposal uh, that has statewide impact. Uh, it reaches all of the people across the state of Minnesota. And when enacted, it will strengthen the work of our state and local governments. Uh, and it will uh, become uh, the foundation for the next generation, if you will, of the work of our agencies, of uh, working groups that come together, of councils uh, that make sure that the government that serves the people of Minnesota is durable and sturdy and inclusive and representative of all of the people of the state of Minnesota. I think that that is an important goal and one I hope that we share together. Yesterday, uh, when the Capitol was filled with veterans uh, and the rotunda was filled with veterans, we talked about not just the notion of freedom and the sacrifice people have made uh, for our freedom, but we also talked about a government that is by and for the people. And it is something that I treasure and I cherish. And I, I appreciate that there are differences among us about what that means, uh, but I know that that is a value that we share together, that we are in Minnesota and in America a government that serves the people, is built by the people, and it's for the people. And I believe this proposal before us uh, takes us in the direction of a sturdy, well-funded government to serve the people, to be modern, and to be effective. Uh, I have been thinking a lot about houses and cars and fixing them up. Uh, I grew up in a fix-it-up family. Uh, we didn't have a lot of money, so we fixed up our own homes. We fixed up our own cars. Uh, and this bill is a lot of fixing up our own home. We have to make sure that the roof doesn't leak. Uh, we have to make sure that uh, you know, this, the foundation is strong. Um, and I think this, this proposal takes care of those things, but it also has some additions, um, some new ideas, some new rooms, some new space um, that makes the work that this government does here in the state of Minnesota uh, a place for everybody. It includes everybody. It reflects everybody, and it represents everybody. Uh, and so I am I'm delighted to be with you today uh, to talk about uh, what's here. Uh, and I know that we have a number of testifiers. Um, and so I'm going to turn to our counsel and our fiscal analyst to walk us through the bill um, so that everybody has a chance to take a look at that. Um, I'm really delighted that we'll have so many testifiers here uh, to talk about what's before us. Uh, and then at the end of that, we will, um, we will conclude the work of the day. Other, if you have questions, I can take them. But we'll come back on Monday then to do the debate of the bill uh, and the markup of the bill. And with that, I would, Madam Chair, um, turn to our counsel. Thank you. Ms. James, are you, the fiscal analyst will have go first. Mr. Erickson? Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Uh, I'll briefly orient us to the spreadsheets again. These are very similar to the spreadsheets that you saw uh, yesterday for the, the veterans bill. In this case, there is one extra page on the detailed spreadsheet uh, reflecting a general fund summary. So that one's a little bit new. This is a general fund only summary on the front page. 
uh, with many of the same columns across the top. The governor's recommendations next to the Senate recommendations and then uh, brown shaded columns reflecting the change from base. The farthest left set of columns are the current biennium that we're right in right now, fiscal 22 and 23. The middle columns are the budget biennium where the, the main budget conversation is happening and the green shaded columns are the, the tails columns. If you flip to page two of that, you will see at the bottom the uh, total spending over, um, over the base. And so you'll see that in the, uh, the Senate column at the bottom, net general fund spending in the current biennium is negative $58.1 million. And in the, in the budget biennium, it is $458.1 for a net general fund spend of this budget biennium of $400 million. The ensuing pages are the detailed spreadsheet that we did see a version of yesterday with the vet, so I won't go into that one with uh, a whole lot of detail, but it does have um, non-general funds on it uh, for folks who are interested in a much more detailed breakout uh, by office. For instance, the legislature will, or, uh, the LCC at the legislature will have um, line items for various budget offices where these other spreadsheets will, will be um, at a higher level. With that, I'll turn to the change item spreadsheet. And again, these numbers here reflect the change from base only, so the numbers you are seeing are, are the change, not an appropriation total. So beginning at the top with the legislature, you'll see that the legislature or the uh, Senate has a $9.8 million biennial appropriation change. The House has a $15.7 million appropriation change. The LCC, this operating adjustment includes some new requests for IT and upgrades as well as uh, operating adjustments, and that is a $47.1 million um, change, though a, a large portion of this is one time. You'll see that in the second year it's $7.8 million, and that's the number that carries into the tails, uh, not the larger number in the first year. There is $400,000 in the bill for an Office on Economic Status of Women at the LCC, $500,000 one time for Senate File 83, Senator McEwen's bill on legis legislative employees and collective bargaining, and $232,000 one time for Senator Morris and Senate File 1022, uh, establishing a legislative task force on aging. The, for the governor's office, there is a $10.9 million appropriation increase and $290,000 one time for the Office of Tribal State Relations you'll see a, a negative appropriation or a neg a negative expenditure change underneath out of the special revenue fund. And what this reflects is a change in the way that many of the FTEs at the governor's office are funded. Currently, there's a lot of interagency transfers that occur uh, and which are transferred into a special revenue account and then the expenditure takes place out of there. This funding model is changing those FTEs to a uh, direct appropriation funding model in the governor's office. For the state auditor, there are several governor's recommendations that have been adopted, including a $1.5 million operating adjustment, $800,000 for administrative support, uh, several FTEs, including technology staffing, a township specialist, legal uh, and legal and special invest investigation staffing. Uh, there is also some funding for electronic auditing tools and two change items of one-time spending for a city and town accounting system upgrade and reporting another compliance dashboard with those two items totaling 1.1 million one time. The Attorney General has two change items that were funded at governor's levels, the $25.4 million for the operating adjustment as well as a one-time operating adjustment of uh, around $10 million. The Secretary of State has several change items that were not uh, in the elections area and so the, the balance of those change items appear here including the operating adjustment of $764,000 for the biennium, $760,000 for the Safe at Home program, and $236,000 for expanding uh, the Business Services Division along with Translation Services and Materials. $400,000 is uh, carried here but is sort of split between the elections and the uh, State Government Committee reflecting increased security needs for both the Business Services and the Elections Divisions. Uh, the there is a $176,000 ongoing appropriation for a diversity, equity, accessibility, and inclusion coordinator, and two items of one-time spending here, including an upgrade to the content management system, as well as a move of the data center from its current location into a new location. Those two items totaling $1 million. The Capital Area Architectural and Planning Board has $165,000 to maintain current service levels 
and several one-time appropriations, $185,000 for zoning and design rulemaking, uh, $500,000 for commemorative works on the Capitol grounds, as well as $1 million to update the Capitol Mall design framework plan, which works in tandem with another change item at the Department of Administration. The Office of Administrative Hearings has a $61,000 maintain current service levels change item, as well as a one-time appropriation for $2.1 million to update the public comment portal. There's also a few changes that are occurring in the Workers' Compensation Fund fund that the, uh, that the office uh, has, has some expenditures out of. A large portion of this is for maintaining current set service levels, but there is also some for increased courtroom security and an operational increase to improve some of the services that the, the office provides. The Office of Minute Services has, um, has quite a few change items that are funded at the governor's levels. You'll note that several of these are one time. Um, the, the maintaining current, current levels, service levels here is $1.4 million ongoing, but then there's 32.9 in one time funding for cybersecurity enhancements, 33.6 million one time for an enterprise cloud transformation, 40 million one time for targeted application modernization. 4 million for children's cabinet IT innovation. This is a slightly different funding model than the governor had recommended. Uh, it has been pushed forward from the tails to make this a one-time spend uh, with extended availability that you'll find in the rider. There's also $600,000 for accessible technology, $734,000 for an expansion at the Mingeo office, and $2.5 million for executive branch digital media services. There is a change item originating from Senate file 1659, Senator Carlson's bill relating to public land survey system monuments and a grant program that would be run there. This is $22 million in one-time funding, part for uh, grants and some allowed to be withheld for administration of that program. The Department of Administration also has a, a large smattering of governor's change items here at the top before we'll get to some of the members' bills near the bottom. This includes $3.3 million to maintain current service levels, $700,000 to provide the state match to the federal funds that come in for the Procurement Technical Assistance Center, $20 million for space consolidation, relocation, and rent loss relating to the, the footprint that uh, on the capital complex of state agencies. Uh, there's $1.2 million for the in lieu of rent appropriation, which covers the cost of spaces for which no tenant pays rent, which would include some spaces in the capital complex. Um, the four, there's $478,000 for the archaeological and cemetery site inventory portal, $400,000 for the, the state archaeologist office in general. Uh, $12.5 million is being deposited into the Risk Management Fund property self-insurance for reinsurance purposes and bolstering the, uh, the, the fund um, that is seeing increased pressure on, and um, reinsurance issues there. Uh, $650,000 for the, the SMART team, that is the small agency resource team that uh, assists several small agencies with HR type functions. Uh, $985,000 for SHPO's electronic project systems and database integration. There is uh, not fun funding in this bill for the Office of Enterprise Sustainability's direct funding model that was rec recommended by the governor. That will continue to be funded on a billing model. There is, however, $1.9 million in the bill for an increase for that Office of Enterprise Sustainability. There's $2 million in the bill to increase oversight at the Office of Grants Management and $894,000 for grants management equity initiatives. Uh, that portion is one time. $2.5 million is in the bill for the statewide grants management system feasibility study. Senator Gustafson carried this bill as Senate file 2447. There's $2.5 million in the bill for the Office of Enterprise Translations, $1.5 million for an economic disparity study in state procurement. $1 million for IT project and program management, $102,000 for a small agency study. Uh, Senator Swadzinski carried Senate file 869 for public TV block grants. Those are funded in the bill at $500,000 in each year of the first biennium, but that is a one-time appropriation. There is one-time funding for Ampers to launch a statewide diverse community news service that was a, a, a Senator Kunesh bill, Senate file 1914, that is funded at the requested level from Ampers of $1.3 million. Uh, also from Senator Kunesh was Senate file 1514, the Ampers Community Service and Equipment Grants. That's shown as $3 million. It is $2.2 million for 
uh, an emergency uh, equipment grant or emergency equipment grants and eight hundred thousand dollars for the community service grants. There is two point two million dollars in the bill to support the parking fund, which has seen increased pressure uh, on the capital complex as there's less money coming into that fund than uh, than is typical. Five hundred and twenty thousand dollars for state demographic center researchers. Here is the other half of the state, uh, the Capital Mall Design Framework Plan. This is $5 million at admin. Uh, $900,000 is for Senate File 2156, Senator Murphy's Buy Clean and Buy Fair Minnesota Act. $186,000 to provide uh, some, some programming and training support for Senate File 2431, Senator May Quaid's new Council on LGBTQIA Minnesotans and a similar amount for uh, Senate File 194, Senator Swadzinski's bill creating a youth advisory council. Moving to the next page. I almost missed my heading at the bottom. This is now in uh, Minnesota Management and Budget, and there is a change here for maintaining current service levels of $5.5 .5 million. There is some forward shifted funds here for uh, $26 million worth of funding to the Enterprise Resource Planning ERP systems um, that MMB spoke about earlier this session. Uh, there is ongoing funding there, but it is a, a little more front loaded than the governor's initial recommendation. There is $4.4 million in the bill for increased staffing, uh, $2 million for enterprise continuity planning, $1 million for a statewide internal office audit office. $4.7 million to establish an, uh, an enterprise strategy and performance team. $4 million one time for costs related to the children's cabinet. $634,000 for uh, collaboration, uh, or excuse me, for the capital budget outreach and assistance. Uh, and $5 million for collaboration on a, a data disaggregation. That was a newer governor's revised recommendation. And finally, there is uh, one more uh, member bill here, Senate File 1261, Senator May Quaid. I uh, brought, uh, sorry, Senate File 1261 forward as the employment and retention of empl employees with disabilities. Um, some provisions in there cost MMB about 162000 in the first biennium. There are also some changes in MMB's non-operating budget, which includes an, a one-time increase in the contingent accounts of $2.5 million, um, though they default back to base amounts in the tails. You'll see the, uh, the adjustment, the, the counterbalanced adjustment to the adjustment to um, the governor's office moving to the, the direct funding model and away from an, an interagency transfer model. Um, so the, in order to balance the new amount that is going into the governor's office, MMB is instructed to reduce agency budgets in an amount matching uh, the amount that we expected not to be paid uh, expenditures in the special revenue fund for the governor's office. There's also a one-time cancellation of a balance that is sitting in the COVID-19 management account. In the current biennium, that is a $58.3 million cancellation. There is $41.6 million in the bill for the Department of Revenue to maintain current service levels, $2.7 million for the Gambling Control Board to maintain current service levels, and that's an appropriation out of the Special Revenue Fund uh, where uh, there's a, a special revenue fund where certain fees come in and it's paid out of there, so this is no hit to the general fund. The Racing Commission similarly has a $61,000 maintained current service levels that comes out of a special revenue account, but there's also $1 million from the general fund to implement the Horse Racing Integrity and Safety Act. The Amateur Sports Commission has a $36,000 appropriation to maintain current service levels as well as $100,000 to add a fiscal coordinator. The Minnesotans of African Heritage Council has four, uh, excuse me, $90,000 to maintain current service levels and $417,000 for additional staffing. The Latino Affairs Council has $46,000 to maintain current ser service levels and $210,000 for a communications specialist. The Asian Pacific Council has a $200,000 appropriation to maintain current service levels. The Indian Affairs Council, 129,000 to maintain current service levels, 240,000 for a new legislative and policy director, and $600,000 to implement the Private Cemeteries Act update that Ms. James will speak about in a minute. Uh, the new councils being created by Senate File 2431 and Senate File 194 that I referenced earlier under admin are, uh, are here, the Council on LGBTQIA Minnesotans and the Youth Advisory Council. 
999,000 for Senator May Quaid's bill, $1.03 million for Senator Swadzinski's. The Minnesota Historical Society has a couple of change items here, $4 million to maintain current service levels, 750,000 one time for earned revenue recovery uh, due to lower than expected uh, revenues during um, the pandemic. $35,000 is here one time for Senator Kunesh's Senate File 386, which is the State Emblems Redesign Commission the committee heard earlier this year, and $200,000 for a one-time increase to Farm America for which the Minnesota Historical Society is the fiscal agent. There's also $19.2 million here for historic sites asset preservation. This is a one-time appropriation. The Arts Board has $39,000 to maintain current service levels and $400,000 ongoing to increase their grants oversight capacity. The Humanities Center has $190,000 to maintain current service levels as well as a $700,000 increase to the Healthy Eating Here at Home program. This is a one-time appropriation and, and will um, default back to the, base fund, the current base funding in the tails. The Accountancy Board has a $61,000 change to maintain current service levels and $240,000 for additional staffing. The Architectural and Engineering Board has only a maintains current service levels for $58,000. Likewise, the Barber Examiner's Board for $188,000. The Cosmetology Board has $1.1 million to maintain current service levels, and there's also money to implement the Hair Technician Licensing in Senate File 1259, Senator Mann's bill. Uh, and then finally, there is a $50,000 one-time appropriation for the Bureau of Mediation Services relating to the legislative employees and collective bargaining um, provisions of Senate, Senator McHugh and Senate File 83. If you'll turn to the back, there are a couple moving pieces that are not just in the expenditures. You'll see uh, in the, the general fund that there is some billing revenue that comes in from the state auditor's office that is expected to come with their increased staffing. That generates a revenue of $866,000 in the current biennium. Uh, there's also a loss to the general fund that is expected a, a, a transfer that is usually made into the general fund out of the parking fund that is being waived uh, for a, a loss to the general fund of $2 million. Uh, finally, there is an expected revenue that comes with the hair technician licensing of $39,000, which will be ongoing beginning when that licensing comes online in fiscal year 25. I will pass over these non-general fund ones for now. They're related to the, the governor's operating adjustment we spoke about before and some of the other change items. Uh, finally, the last piece that has to be accounted for is the uh, is other bills that are moving that, uh, that have passed out of the Finance Committee. In this case, there's only one that is in the state government jurisdiction, and that is on line 282, Senate File 1816, Senator Murphy's bill, uh, uh, plugging the OAH deficiency that was heard on the floor and passed. And with, uh, actually, Madam Chair, one more second. I just want to point to, in the bill language, you, of course, can find all of the riders that des describe the uh, change items that I just walked through. Beginning on page 21, there is some other uncodified sections that are that provide that $50,000 one, one-time appropriation to the Bureau of Mediation Services, the enabling language for the COVID-19 management cancellation, and the enabling language in section 39 for the appropriation reduction to executive agencies. And with that, Madam Chair, that concludes the, the presentation of the, the fiscal changes in the bill. Thank you, Mr. Erickson. Uh, Council James, do you mind walking through? Madam Chair and members, uh, I will walk through the pro provisions in articles two, three, and four of the bill. Um, Article 2 are various uh, state government related uh, policy changes. Article 3 is specifically the minute um, changes. And Article 4 are changes related to the uh, disability um, bill, retention and, and recruitment of um, in, in state employment. Um, in Article 2 then, sections 1 through 5, beginning on page 22, adopt a new official state seal and flag that are going to be designed by a commission that's established in an uncoded section later in the bill. Sections 6 and 7 on page 23 are the first of several sections that would allow legislative employees to have an election to be represented by an exclusive representative to bargain with legislative employers on terms and conditions of employment. 
Section eight on page 24 is the first of a few sections that relate to moving duties related to strategic and long range planning from an office um, that currently exists to the Commissioner of Management and Budget. Similar duties are, are assigned to the Commissioner of Management and Budget in a later section. And these sections, these several sections will eliminate references to the Office of Strategic and Long Range Development. Section 9 on page 24 creates a Minnesota Youth Advisory Council. This is Senator Swadzinski's bill, Senate File 194. Section 10 on page 28 creates a Council on LGBTQIA Minnesotans. This is from Senate File 2431, um, authored by Senator May Quaid. Section 11 uh, is at the top of page 32, and this is uh, part of the governor's supplemental recommendations. Um, this provides for the CAP board to change the capital campus design framework. This is part of the 2040 comprehensive plan for the capital area. This section specifies um, that the framework has to provide for green space on the southwest and northeast corners of the intersection at Rice and University and also on the north side of the Capitol. The framework is also required to provide visual markers and welcome information at the corner of Rice Street and University and to anchor a path to the Capitol and the mall with interpretive markers that honor the status of the Capitol as a historic site and a modern active public gathering space. The framework is also required um, that trees be planted throughout the Capitol campus, prioritizing mature tree canopy to provide shade for users of the Capitol Mall between or adjacent to the Capitol building and Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard. Section 12 on page 32 authorizes the Commissioner of Administration to apply for and receive grants and then creates a statutory appropriation of that money to the Commissioner. This is from Senator Mitchell's bill, Senate file 2246. Section 13 begins on page 33. This is the section that establishes responsibilities for the planning and some other management functions with the Commissioner of uh, Management and Budget. It also requires the Commissioner to develop a system of economic, social, and environmental performance measures. On page 33, section 14 requires approval of the Commissioner of Management and Budget for the rate that one agency charges another for services paid from the statewide systems account. This is from uh, the governor's bill, Senate file 2979. Section 15 on page 33 relates to um, the administration's billing of other entities for their services. This section eliminates the annual limit on the amount that the commissioner of administration may bill for statewide system services. That cap right now is $10 million. This also adds authority for the Commissioner of Administration to charge the legislature for services. It eliminates the authority of the administration to charge the University of Minnesota for services. On page 33, section 16, um, establishes requirements for certain materials and products used in the construction of buildings funded in whole or in part with state bond funds. This is from Senate Murf Senator Murphy's um, bill, Senate file 2156. Um, it establishes a pilot program for the administration and transportation to obtain estimates from vendors on the life cycle greenhouse gas emissions of select products. It also requires the commissioner to establish a maximum acceptable global warming potential for eligible materials, um, and the commissioner must set those potentials for specific products that serve as examples of the same eligible materials. It also establishes a task force for consideration of, of these sorts of issues. On page 39, section 17 creates an Office of Enterprise Sustainability to assist state agencies in reducing the impact on the environment um, of their operations and controlling unnecessary waste of natural resources and public funds. Um, this section is also from the Governor's Bill, Senate File 2979. Section 40. No, excuse me, on page 40, section 18 establishes an Office of Enterprise Translations to provide translation services for written materials for executive branch agencies and other duties related to translations. Also on page 40, section 19 reduces the 
um, it lowers the threshold for eligibility of um, one-time expenses that can be paid for reasonable accommodations um, that agencies can be reimbursed for from the accommodation account. This is for employees um, who need accommodations for employment. Sections 20 through 28, beginning on page 41, provide additional authority and resources for the Commissioner of Administration to oversee grants. And these sections are also from Senate File 2979. Um, <clears throat> Section 20 requires executive agencies to cooperate with the Commissioner of Administration in the creation, management, and oversight of state grants. That's on page 41. It also authorizes the Commissioner to adopt rules to carry out grant governance and oversight. Section 21, also beginning on page 41, authorizes the Commissioner of Administration to suspend or debar grantees from eligibility to receive state grants for up to three years um, for reasons specified in rules. It also allows a grantee to obtain an administrative hearing to contest a suspension or debarment. And it authorizes the Commissioner of Administration to establish an office uh, um, to carry out grants management. Finally, that section requires granting agencies to submit grant solicitation documents for review prior to issuance um, to the commissioner. Section 42 on page 42 authorizes the commissioner of administration to oversee executive agency grant management systems. Uh, section 23 on page 43 makes grant agreements and, and their amendments void unless approved by the commissioner of administration. This section is effective April 1st of 2024. Section 24 on page 44 authorizes the Commissioner of Administration to require a granting agency to report to the Commissioner on the status of a grant at any time. Section 25 on page 44 adds the Commissioner of Administration to the list of pe people who are allowed to audit records of a grantee um, for at least six years after the grant agreement end date or later in some circumstances. Current law authorizes the granting agency, the legislative auditor, or the state auditor to have that access, and this adds the Commissioner of Administration. Section 26 on page 44 requires an agency head to report specified information about grants over a threshold of $25,000 to the Commissioner of Administration. The report has to include an evaluation of the grantee's performance. The commissioner has to make the report available publicly online. This section is effective August 1st, 2024. Um, the next section, section 27, is eliminated in the A5 amendment. Section 28 requires grant agreements to include authorization for the commissioner of administration to unilaterally terminate a grant agreement if the commissioner determines that further performance would not serve agency purposes or is not in the best interests of the state. On page 46, um, this is another section that eliminates reference to the Office of Strategic and Long Range Planning. And section 30 on page 47 is another of the sections related to legislative employees um, having an election for an exclusive representative. Section 31 on page 48, another section that deletes reference to the Office of Strategic and Long Range Planning. Then sections 32 through 40 relate to the Board of Cosmetology. Most of these sections, 32 through 39, are um, all for the purpose of instituting a license for hair technicians in the licensing scheme of the Board of Cosmetology. Section 40 um, simplifies the license scheme for salons. And this is from Senator Mann's bill, um, Senate file 1259. Moving to page 53, um, sections 41 and 42 are two more sections relating to legislative employees um, being able to elect an exclusive representative. Section 43 on page 54 makes changes to the existing program for the treatment of human remains in cemeteries. This section um, <clears throat> requires that the state archaeologists maintain a system of records identifying the location of known recorded or suspected cemeteries um, and provides... Um, uh, for the records to be kept in a particular manner. It allows the state archaeologist discretion over whether to assess the condition of non-American Indian cemeteries based on the specified needs or, or at the request of an agency, landowner, or other appropriate authority. <clears throat> and then it also um, gives, <coughs> 
excuse me, con, um, the authority to conduct a condition assessment on American Indian cemeteries to the Indian Affairs Council. Again, based on specified needs or at the request of an agency, landowner, or other appropriate authority. Um, cemeteries that contain the remains of both American Indians and non-American Indians shall be assessed at the discretion of the state archaeologist in collaboration with the Indian Affairs Council. The state archaeologist or the Indian Affairs Council has 90 days from the date a request is made to begin a cemetery condition assessment or provide notice to the requester whether an assessment is needed. It also authorizes the state archaeologist and the Indian Affairs Council to retain a qualified professional archaeologist, a qualified forensic anthropologist, or other experts to gather information that the archaeologist or council might need to assess the cemeteries. Um, it eliminates a requirement that the state pay the costs for condition assessment on uh, burial grounds um, on private lands or waters. It specifies that human remains be treated with the utmost respect for dignity and provides a role for the Indian Affairs Council um, in identifying burial of American Indians. It removes a requirement to return remains to tribal entities when the tribal entity, entity could be ascertained. It requires the state archaeologist and the Indian Affairs Council to enter into a memorandum of understanding to coordinate their responsibilities under this section. It requires that construction plans be submitted to the state archaeologist on a slightly different time frame than is currently required. Um, the plans will now need to be submitted before plans are finalized. Um, and uh, rather than um, when bids are advertised. And it extends the time from 30 to 45 days that the archaeologist and the council may take to review the plans. It clarifies um, the status of some data related to uh, these um, records. It authorizes a designee of the state archaeologist to enter property to authenticate burial sites, and it also authorizes the Indian Affairs Council to enter property to assess or identify American Indian cemeteries. On page 61, sections 44 and 45 establish a grant program for counties to get state funding to update or maintain the public land survey mon uh, monuments. This is from Senate File 1659, Senator Carlson's bill. Sections 46 and 47 are a chair's initiative. These changed the date of the effective date for the Juneteenth law that was passed earlier this session. The law that passed earlier this session had an effective date of August 1st uh, to make it effective before the next Juneteenth. These, these sections, sections 46 and 47 on page 62, set the effective date as the day after enactment of this bill. Section 48 on page 62 creates the commission to design the state seal and flag. Section 49 on page 63 creates a legislative task force on aging. This is from Senator Morrison's bill, Senate file 1022. Section 50 on page 66 sets deadlines for the initial appointments in the first meeting for the Youth Advisory Council. And section, six, section 51 does the same thing for the Council on LGBTQIA Minnesotans. Section 52 establishes an enterprise grants management system feasibility study that Mr. Erickson uh, noted. It requires the Commissioner of Administration to assess the viability of implementing a single grants management system for executive agencies. And then if the study determines one, si one system is feasible, the study uh, must um, pro provide some additional information. Section 53 on page 66 um, requires the Commissioner of Administration to study and make recommendations on how to more, most effectively support small agencies. Um, that report is due to the legislature in February of 2024. Section 54 um, is a duplicate of Section 52, and it is removed in the A5 amendment. Section 55 on page 67 has repealers. This repeals the description of the current emblem um, and the designation of an official state flag. Um, so these are related to um, Senator Kunesh's bill, Senate File 386, to redesign the seal and the flag. Paragraph B repeals the current enabling statute for the Minnesota Youth Council Committee that's organized under the nonprofit Minnesota Alliance with Youth. This, again, is from Senate File 194, Sen from Senator Swadzinski. Um, paragraph C of the repealer repeals sections relating to the Office of Strategic and long-range planning. Paragraph D repeals a law that transferred 
um, that is the waiver of the, uh, the transfer to the general fund from the parking fees account um, that Mr. Erickson described. Article three, um, beginning on page 67, contains Senate file 2253, Senator Murphy's bill, and also one section from the governor's bill. It relates to the Department of Information Technology. Sections one through nine um, are the minute bill um, that the committee heard. These sections make changes to the duties and operations of the department and also have some technical and cleanup changes. And then section uh, nine, um, establishes the grant program that's administered by the Department of Information Technology to provide funding to counties and local governments for projects that address cybersecurity threats to their information systems. Article 4, beginning on section, uh, beginning on page 74, is um, all from Senate File 1261, Senator May Quaid's bill. This bill reflected the recommendations of the Advisory Task Force on State Employment and Retention of Employees with Disabilities. The section, sections in this article make a number of changes to facilitate the hiring and retention of people with disabilities in state employment. Um, they, the, these sections require that qualified people with disabilities must be given special emphasis in, recruit, in recruitment for state employment. It requires that all technology and digital content related to recruiting and hiring must be accessible. Hiring managers and people involved in the candidate selection process must be aware of the accommodation fund. It requires that the commissioner make online application process and all digital content accessible to people with disabilities. It makes modifications to the existing process that allows an applicant with a disability um, of a significant, significant nature to work on the job. Um, it makes modifications to the state's affirmative action program for employees of the civil service. It requires the Commissioner of Management and Budget to designate a statewide ADA and Disability Employment Director. It requires the head of each agency in the executive branch to designate an ADA coordinator um, with primary responsibilities for the administration of ADA policies um, within that agency. It requires training for employees and for managers and supervisors on issues related to employment of people with disabilities. It requires agencies to conduct annual um, ADA self-assessment um, and it requires the Commissioner of Management and Budget to convene an advisory committee to make recommendations regarding updates and clarifications uh, to the service worker class specifications. And, and that is the, the end of the articles two through four. Thank you, Council. Um, at this time, do members have any questions for our fiscal staff or Council? Okay, seeing no questions, I would like to start inviting testifiers to come up to speak on the bill. Um, our first testifier, at least on the list I have, is Deputy Commissioner Britta Rattan. I apologize if I get any of these names wrong, I'm still learning them all. <laughs> and if you could please state your name and title for the record. Good morning. Uh, my name is Britta Rayton, Deputy Commissioner with Minnesota Management and Budget. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak on the importance of this omnibus bill to MMB and to the state enterprise. MMB plays a key role in bringing state agencies and community partners together to improve the lives of all Minnesotans. This bill recognized the essential, essential centralized role that MMB plays and that is foundational to state government operations and to sound, transparent management of state employee and financial resources. I can summarize in three areas aspects of the omnibus bill that will help MMB continue to work collaboratively throughout the state enterprise to enhance security, efficiency, and capacity, and to ensure the continuity and effectiveness of state service for Minnesota's people, businesses, and communities. The first area involves securing and maintaining the foundational services and support for state government. Without reliable funding sources, MMB would no longer be able to provide even current levels of service for the state's enterprise resource planning or ERP systems that all three branches of government use 
for accounting, human resources, and financial reporting. This bill is creating sustainable funding sources to secure these systems that serve as the backbone of our state government operations. Apart from our ERP systems, which have a structural deficit, the cost of doing business is rising for everyone, including MMB. This omnibus bill also provides additional operational funding to recognize those growing costs, which we appreciate. The second area involves providing strategic leadership that maximizes investments, resources, and fiscal oversight for every state agency. This bill is funding additional FTE for some of our core financial management and oversight functions at MMB, including establishing a statewide federal funds coordination unit, um, additional budget analysis and monitoring, um, additional FTEs for banking and payroll services, as well as debt management and regulatory compliance. The bill also shores up the executive branch's business continuity capacity in the following ways. By implementing a comprehensive business continuity software solution across the enterprise, by providing a centralized mass notification system for the enterprise, and by providing enhanced support for workplace violence prevention and continuity of operations planning for all state agencies. The bill also expands MMB's internal control and account accounting team to establish a statewide internal audit office. This will help protect taxpayer dollars, ensuring state government works as efficiently and effectively as possible. I appre appreciate the additional resources that were directed to these needs. And the third and final area I want to highlight prioritizes people-centered, gov good government solutions. This legislation establishes an enterprise strategy and performance team at MMB to centrally coordinate state strategic planning efforts, cross-agency policy analysis, and planning around core long-term challenges that are impacting Minnesotans. The language also expands MMB's capacity to provide capital budget outreach and assistance, particularly for capital projects owned by nonprofits and political subdivisions that do not already participate in the capital budget process. And the omnibus bill also provides funds to establish a cross-agency work group to develop minimum data collection standards for race, ethnicity, gender identity, and disability status across the enterprise as well as develop a roadmap and timeline for implementing these data standards enterprise-wide. I do want to note the legislation, however, does not currently include the governor's recommendation on the Compensation Council, and we hope we can have more conversation about that as the session progresses. That said, I want to thank the committee and the chair for including so many of the governor and lieutenant governor's recommendations in this bill. Thank you. Thank you so much, Deputy Commissioner. Um, up next, I have Commissioner Marquat from the Department of Revenue. And just so you know, on deck, please, Commissioner Roberts Davis. Thank you. So, thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair and members. I'm Paul Marquart, the Commissioner of the Department of Revenue. And just a huge thank you to the committee, Madam Chair, uh, for funding Governor Walz's and Lieutenant Governor Flanagan's request for the Department of Revenue. Uh, the Department of Revenue administers and enforces the assessment and collection of $33 billion of revenue. And as we know, those revenues go to pay for very important investments around the state. And the cost of doing all of that for $33 billion, the administrative cost is very efficient at 0.6 of 1% uh, of those revenues that are brought in by the Department of Revenue. And uh, Chair Murphy had mentioned today is March 31st. Uh, members, a reminder that April 18th is only 18 days away to file those taxes. <laughs> and up to this point, the department has received about 1.5 million of the expected 3 million uh, returns that will be coming in and have issued about 1 million refunds. 
And right now, the time frame for processing and getting out those refunds is about eight to nine days. And a lot of people think the Department of Revenue is just collecting income taxes. There are a number of other customers that we have, over 800 assessors we work with, 500,000 businesses, 370,000 sales tax filers. Uh, we provide uh, payments that go out to uh, cities and counties, of course. We have a collection division. So there's a lot of work done by our excellent employees to, to work for our customers around the state. And Chair Murphy, you had mentioned about uh, how your, this bill is talking about governance and government. And we know that the Department of Revenue, like many agencies in the state, is a window into our state government. And every customer that interacts with the state uh, will either build their faith or lessen their faith in government and ultimately democracy. And the employees at the Department of Revenue take that responsibility very, very seriously. So this, will, uh, this funding level will help uh, continue the betterment of an employee and customer experience at the Department of Revenue. And again, uh, members of the committee, Chair Murphy, thank you so much for this funding. Uh, it is greatly appreciated, and we continue to look forward to working with you as the process uh, goes forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner. I'm, I'm feeling a little guilty now because I'm one of those. Usually I'm ahead, and for some reason in this busy session, I'm, I'm behind this year. Um, on deck will be John Eichton of Minute. And, uh, but first, of course, we have Commissioner Roberts Davis from the Department of Administration. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Good morning. I am Alice Roberts Davis, Commissioner for the Department of Administration. And I would like to thank Chair Murphy and the members of the committee for including almost all of the governor's recommendations for admin in the omnibus state government budget bill. It is a pleasure to be here this morning addressing these really great investments in state operations. Uh, as you know, admin is primarily an enterprise service agency and we provide core business functions that are the administrative backbone for state agencies. Uh, in short, when admin works, state government works. This funding proposed in Senate file 1426 will help admin to do our best work and be innovative and accommodate agency needs. Specifically, the bill supports our efforts to provide more equitable and transparent services to our partners. It addresses the significantly increased demand for our services, and the bill utilizes our expertise to address current agency needs for building reconfigurations. I do want to highlight the importance of some of the recommendations that were included. Senate file 1426 provides the necessary funding to meet our increased demand for services. Requests for reviews and assistance from other agencies and the public has steadily increased over the last few years while staffing levels have remained relatively flat. These funds will also accommodate an important policy update to the Private Cemeteries Act and specifically support the work of the Office of the State Archaeologist. The workload in this office has tripled since 2017 while the staff of three has not grown. Admin has the expertise to help state agencies to more effectively use current space. The funding in Senate file 1426 will provide the state with the resources for agencies to consolidate their office space and focus their operating budgets on their core missions. The bill will also stabilize the parking fund and protect public parking um, facilities while agencies work through reconfiguring their offices. We want to thank you for including additional authority for admin to improve grants administration oversight. These changes in funding will enhance transparency and equity in state grant making, as well as ensure that agencies have the minimal funds necessary to oversee state grants. Access to quality translations under a new Office of Enterprise Translations will enable agencies to provide necessary information to all Minnesotans, even if English is not their first language. One particular provision that I would like to highlight is the funding for our Procurement Technical Assistance Center, as it will allow us to continue to outreach and train our small businesses throughout Minnesota and, uh, and assist them with contracting with state and local federal government. This work is provided in part through our partnership with the U.S. Department of Defense. As you work through the conference committee process, I would just ask that you also consider directly funding the Office of Enterprise Sustainability. Uh, they are currently working under interagency agreements. 
So finally, I just want to reiterate our uh, gratitude for so much inclusion from the governor's budget recommendations. These are great investments in state government that will address the increased demand for our much needed services at the department. Thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Um, next for our testimony, um, and I apologize for not stating your title earlier, Deputy Commissioner Eichton. Um, and after that, we will have Secretary of State Simon, please. Go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. For the record, my name is John Eichton, Minnesota IT Services Deputy Commissioner. Thank you for the opportunity to provide some brief remarks on Senate File 1426. I want to thank the Chair and the committee members uh, for their support for the Governor's recommendations in the area of information technology. Uh, these will be critical investments in uh, not only information technology infrastructure, but application modernization, interagency innovation, cybersecurity, accessibility, and geospatial technology. Uh, over decades, the state has accrued a significant amount of information technology debt uh, that leads to cyber operational risk, that hinders operational efficiencies, and that constrains and limits our agency's ability to transform how they deliver services to Minnesotans. The investments included in this bill would enable a secure, resilient, scalable, cloud-based foundation for the next generation of state technology. It would enable a more strategic, targeted approach to modernizing applications, as well as the services that those applications support. It would strengthen the state's security posture, uh, including a modernization of our state's approach to identity and access management. It would improve the accessibility of state technology for those residents with disabilities and help ensure the coordinated collection and distribution of geospatial data and services across state and local government, reducing duplication uh, and improving the quality of, of data about the lands uh, of the state. I also want to thank the committee for inclusion of the policy provisions related to MINUT, to, to modernize MINUT statute and to advance uh, important recommendations from the Technology Advisory Committee. Uh, as well, I want to thank you for inclusion of the state and local cybersecurity grant program. Uh, the $5 million in state money will draw down $18 million in federal dollars. 80% of that uh, needs to go to benefit local government. And we look forward to working with the Minnesota Cybersecurity Task Force to determine the plan for how those dollars would be uh, distributed and used. Uh, in closing, just thank you again for recognizing the opportunity that this session presented to invest in the next generation of state IT. Uh, this will simultaneously address cyber and operational risk and enable the transformation of service delivery to meet Minnesotans' expectations of their state government in the digital age. Uh, we look forward to working with the committee as the bill progresses, and thanks again for the opportunity to testify. Thank you, Thank you very much, Deputy Commissioner. Secretary of State Steve Simon, please, followed by uh, State Auditor Julie Blaha. Good morning. If you could please state your name for the record. Thank you, Madam Chair. Steve Simon, Minnesota Secretary of State. Thank you, members. It's a pleasure to be with you. I want to thank Chair Murphy for her leadership and members of this committee for the opportunity to testify. This bill makes needed and critical investments in our work at the Office of Secretary of State, particularly in what's before this committee, our Business Services Division, one-time office-wide IT infrastructure, and our Safe at Home Division in the office. As I always like to mention, I never fail to mention, I hope, in any budget-related hearing, we are a small profit center for the state. We make $27 million more than we cost. So if you add up everything, every person, every paperclip, everything, we make $27 million more for the state than that. And that's because of the statutory fees that we charge for various business filings. They're fees, by the way, that you and the legislature set. We don't set them. You do. Most of them haven't been reexamined or touched in decades. Year over year, we've increased that contribution to the general fund. Right now, it's, a, uh, it's going up by about a million dollars per year. And the reason for that isn't because the, the fees have gone up. They haven't for decades in most cases, uh, but because business-related filings have increased. The work has actually increased. And so our, our actual budget has remained essentially flat for the last 20 years, even accounting for inflation. So this bill provides an operating adjustment that allows us to maintain our current levels of service while also making needed investments in our business services division, one-time office-wide IT infrastructure, and safe at home. 
As to business services, this bill will support an expansion of the information, training, resources, and translated material that we provide to individuals seeking to form a business in Minnesota, including more proactive outreach to associations and other community partners that assist small businesses all over, all 87 counties. Finally, as it relates to business services, this bill provides funding to support security for our public counter. Some of you know that we moved a couple of years ago and we moved outside of the Capitol complex. That has a lot of advantages in terms of cost savings and others, but one disadvantage of moving outside the Capitol complex is we no longer get Capitol complex security. We don't have the security guards, we don't have the state patrol, we don't have the Capitol police, and so we need to contract to provide that additional security. The other critical funding within this legislation has to do with our Safe at Home Division. And as you'll recall, that was enacted by the legislature in 2006. It's a program that protects victims of assault, stalking, or sexual violence by providing services that allow program participants to live safely and security, securely at a private address that is not disclosed to anyone in the public or private sector. And as I explained when I was last before this committee, the needs have really exploded. They have grown significantly. Participation has gone from fewer than 200 active participants to last December 31st, just under 4,000 active participants. And in the last four years, the Safe at Home Division has experienced a constant increase in applications uh, and a 22% increase in the volume of outgoing mail. That's one of the functions we handle outgoing mail. So we need additional staff that's provided in this bill to perform application certifications and intakes in a timely manner. Uh, this, the work of this division and the Safe at Home program uh, are critical to the safety of thousands of Minnesota and, uh, Minnesotans. And let me just say offhandedly that I really appreciate the longstanding, ironclad, bipartisan support that this particular program has enjoyed. You know, I'm old enough to remember Senator Anderson's old enough to remember times when there have been cuts, not surpluses. And even in times of cuts, there's always been a rally around the Safe at Home program to protect it as much as possible from that because I think everyone acknowledges the value of that program. Finally, I want to thank Chair Murphy for including two one-time costs related to IT infrastructure. The first is dollars to pay for a necessary move of our Office of Secretary of State Data Center. Uh, from one of its two locations. Our primary facility is still in the Minnesota State Retirement System building because um, our office used to maintain its business services division in that building. That's a building from which we moved two years ago. We lost our lease. Uh, but MSRS did not renew the lease and originally allowed us to continue maintaining our data center there. But time is up for that facility as well, so we have to move and it's expensive. The second one-time cost is an upgrade to the office's content management system called Umbraco that is used to deliver our external website. So we look forward to upgrading the system as the current version will reach its end of life at the end of the year. So this bill provides that funding. So I want to thank you for your time and attention. I know you have a busy agenda, but I'm here to express gratitude for the needs met. Catching up with, to extend Senator Murphy's, uh, Chair Murphy's analogy, this is sort of like deferred maintenance on a building, and we are no longer deferring that maintenance thanks to you. Thanks for your time and attention, members. Thank you so much, Mr. Secretary. Um, State Auditor Blaha, I saw you get into position. Get ready. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Chair Mitchell, uh, Lita Anderson, uh, Chair uh, Chair Murphy as well. I'm Julie Blaha, your State Auditor. And to help you stay ahead of the storm today, I'm going to uh, keep it uh, tight. Uh, I just want to thank you so much for the opportunity to thank you so much for including our proposal in this bill. Um, uh, and uh, again, those items that we've talked about before will help us keep serving the needs of Minnesotans. Uh, I want to focus, though, on two uh, uh, additions uh, that you see. First is a, a CTAS upgrade, and another is a compliance dashboard. Now, these proposals are both based on one-time conversation, I'm sorry, one-on-one -on -one conversations we've had with legislators, feedback from local officials during our recent State of Main Street listening tour, and just ongoing discussions. Um, first, our popular small cities and towns accounting system uh, needs underlying code upgrades and further encryption of sensitive data. 
The Office of the State Auditor created, distributes, and supports uh, the small city and town accounting system, CTAS. Uh, the program helps local entities maintain accounting records, assist in bookkeeping taxes, and facilitates the submission of financial records to our office. It's basically QuickBooks for local government. Right now, 288 cities, 1,144 uh, 1, towns, and 11 special districts use this thing. And I have uh, a list if you want to check and see if your town is included. Um, what we're seeing is that entities that use this system on average are more likely to report required data to us on time and accurately. And that is an indicator of overall effectiveness of fiscal management. So our goal is to expand the number of those users. Users appreciate our last upgrade and have had several requests for further improvements for ease and increased uh, ease of use, increased security. So we believe this upgrade will attract more users. In addition, any remaining funds we have would be used to reduce the cost of the program to encourage more small cities and towns to use the software. Now it's only a one-time fee of $300, but if you've ever worked in a township, you know that every dollar matters, so it can be a good incentive. Um, we do, um, uh, our next item is a regulatory compliance and oversight dashboard. Now we've seen this in other states and it's in a response to calls to support better compliance with funding requirements and other rules. Um, what we see is that it can make it easier for local officials and other Minnesotans to view compliance requirements, monitor progress toward full compliance, and find assistance to fulfill those requirements. We know that the easier to track compliance, the more likely entities will be effective in meeting their requirements. Uh, for instance, if a city could see their status of their TIF districts, the reports to our office, all of their alerts in one place, we're gonna see more people paying attention to that. So both items are a way to provide concrete, straightforward tools to increase local fiscal integrity. So overall, this budget would bring us closer to what OSA funding was at the beginning of the century. Even with a, a chunk of it as one-time money, this is a significant recovery and will help us go a long way to uh, helping OSA keep the trust that Minnesotans deserve. Thank you. Thank you, State Auditor. Um, on my list, I had Laura Sales from the oh. Office of the Attorney General. Sorry about that. That's okay. But we will get to you. I should have done what I've been doing, which is next up is. Um, so Ms. Sales from the Office of Attorney General, if you can uh, state your name for the record, please. Chair Murphy, Senator Mitchell, Senator Anderson, and members. My name is Laura Sales, and I'm the Legislative Director for the Attorney General's Office. Attorney General Ellison wishes he could be here today, but he is busy with the ongoing Jewel trial. He asked me to pass along his thanks for including the Attorney General's budget requests in the Omnibus State Government Finance Bill. On behalf of all the hardworking public servants at the Minnesota <coughs> Attorney General's Office and the people of Minnesota, we thank you for the support of the unique and vital work the Attorney General's Office does for Minnesotans everywhere. As A.G. Ellison has testified to your committee before, there has been a dramatic lack of investment in the Office of the Minnesota Attorney General over the last three decades, a lack of investment that is reflected in our staffing levels and ability to do the work needed to help Minnesotans afford their lives and live with safety and dignity. Part of A.G. Ellison's work since he first took office in 2019 and again in 2023 has been to rebuild the state's, the largest statewide public office, public law office in Minnesota. Few law offices in Minnesota handle the range and complexity of civil litigation as the Minnesota Attorney General's Office. Our clients include more than 100 state agencies, boards and commissions, as well as the people of Minnesota. We handle thousands of legal files per year, and every year the AGO, uh, the Attorney General's Office, is a net contributor, often to the tune of millions of dollars, to the general fund. Our work helps Minnesotans across the state. Funding these budget requests will help the Attorney General's Office retain an expert workforce and is probably one of the most important things we can do so that our office can meet the needs of Minnesotans. Our attorneys earn less than public attorneys for local metro counties and almost a third less than attorneys in the U.S. Attorney's Office. This gap in earnings can make it challenging for us to retain our public interest-minded attorneys. Our operating adjustment will also allow us to further support the backbone of the office. The capacity of the administrative, non-legal side of the office has been chronically understaffed. 
While employees of the office are very resourceful and can continue to serve their colleagues well, the capacity of critical internal administrative functions like human resources, information technology, and finance are stretched beyond their limits. There's a lot to do to keep the office running, and we need enough people to do the work that needs to get done. I'd like to re reiterate an important point that Attorney General Ellison has made to you before, namely that the Attorney General's office is a great value for the state and the people of Minnesota. We bring in far more money than it costs to operate the office. In the last four years, the office has returned about $1.5 billion to the state and directly to the people of Minnesota. This includes about $1 billion to residential and small business utility rate payers and more than $300 million in settlements from opioid companies with more than $200 million more yet to come, all of which represents an excellent return on investment to the people of Minnesota. In closing, these budget requests will put us where we would have been if the Attorney General's Office general fund appropriation had kept pace with inflation for the last 30 years. The dedicated public servants of the Attorney General's Office work hard to bring unique and significant value to Minnesotans in every part of the state, and they stand ready to do more with your support. So thank you for investing in them so their talents can continue to benefit the state. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sales. On deck will be uh, Mr. T Stoffrin of the Minnesota Farmers Union. And up now, uh, Mr. Went Wentworth. I appreciate the enthusiasm, though, um, that we have a testifier who is ready to go. So thank you. If you could please state your thank, name for the thank record. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Kent Wentworth. I serve as the Director and CEO of the Minnesota Historic Society. My apologies to the Office of the Attorney General. All I knew is on the printed agenda that I was supposed to follow the state auditor, so I was uh, a little over anxious. So. As I said, I like the enthusiasm. Great, thank you. Madam Chair, Chair Murphy, members of the committee, uh, the Minnesota Historical Society is here to express our deep appreciation for the support provided in this bill. Support for the governor's recommendations for our operating adjustment will help sustain current levels of service. The earned revenue recovery will also ensure that we are able to continue our great public service of preserving and sharing Minnesota's history for all Minnesotans. Education is at the heart of the Minnesota Historical Society's mission. We serve learners of all ages, from school-age students that use the Northern Lights textbook, which we publish, to lifelong learners who attend our programs, read our publications, conduct research in our library and archives, or even online so that they can learn about their family's history, their community's history, and their state's history. In addition, the funding provided for preservation of historic sites facilities will help us to preserve 150 buildings statewide. More than half of those buildings are older than 100 years, and they are under our care. They're not only under our care for today's visitors, but they are under our care for the future generations of Minnesotans. So we deeply appreciate this provision in the bill. Finally, I would like to extend an invitation to the entire committee, uh, certainly after the session, to visit the Minnesota History Center to see firsthand the many ways we fulfill our preservation and education mission, and also for you to meet our talented and dedicated staff. We look forward to working with the committee as you continue this work. Thank you so much for your support. Thank you for your testimony. Um, Mr. Stofferin, if you could please state your name for the record, and Mr. Wojtak, you will be next. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Mitchell, Chair Murphy, and committee members. My name is Justin Stofferin. I'm the Anti-Monopoly Director for the Minnesota Farmers Union, which is a grassroots organization representing family farmers, ranchers, and rural communities in Minnesota. I appreciate the opportunity to be here to testify in support of uh, the funding for the Attorney General's Office in this legislation. Our members have identified uh, limiting corporate control and protecting competition in the marketplace as a top priority for our organization. And this is because farmers are on the front lines of our monopoly crisis. They face extreme consolidation uh, in the market for inputs. Uh, they also face extreme consolidation when taking their goods uh, to, to market. And as a result, uh, while consumers are facing higher prices at the grocery store, the farmer's share of the food dollar has dropped from 50 cents to nearly 14 cents, the lowest on record. Of course, consolidation is not a problem just in agriculture. It's an issue, uh, it's pervasive across the economy. From 1997 to 2012, 75% of industries grew more concentrated. 
Uh, since 2005, uh, the economy as a whole has grown 50% more concentrated. And a recent estimate uh, suggested that at the current rate of consolidation, the U.S. will be left with precisely one company uh, by 2070. And yet, despite this uh, consolidation, as the Attorney General's office uh, just highlighted, uh, they have less staff uh, than they did just a couple decades ago. Um, and in particular, the, the antitrust team, uh, which does phenomenal work, uh, is smaller than a lot of other states of similar size. So we're really appreciative uh, of the funding uh, in this legislation uh, that will help uh, the Attorney General to continue the, the metaphor of, of repair and, and rebuild uh, the, the antitrust team. Uh, the one-time funding to help stand up the, uh, the multi-state uh, litigation fund is also really important um, to uh, helping the, the office uh, protect Minnesotans if policymakers want to address uh, the loss of family farms, the loss of small businesses, low wages, rising prices, just to name a few. Uh, uh, ensuring the AG's office has those resources uh, to protect competition is, is really essential. So thank you again, Chair Murphy, for uh, your leadership on this issue broadly and for including this funding uh, in your proposal. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. testimony. Up next, Mr. Stofferin of the Minnesota Farmers Union, and I'm sorry, um, that's what we just had. Mr. Wojtok of Hunger Solutions, and on deck would be Ms. Sochamel. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Peter Wojtok, Government Relations with Hunger Solutions, Minnesota. I'll be very brief, but just wanted to um, express our appreciation and thanks to this committee for including an increase in funding to the Market Bucks program. This funding comes at a truly vital time uh, to reduce food insecurity in our state with the recent ending of SNAP emergency allotments and high inflation in food prices. Many families will continue to rely on Market Bucks to help them stretch their buying power at local farmers markets. And this investment will help us do that. By expanding the program, we can help get additional dollars to individuals' food budgets to make fresh local food more affordable for even more low-income residents across the state in need. At the same time, help sustain our local farms, improve the health of our communities, and really ensure that this program continues to make a critical impact across the state. So thanks so much for your support. Love getting kids fed. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, Ms. Sushamel, and on deck would be Mr. Raines. If you could please probably correctly state your name for the record, I'd appreciate that. No problem, thank you, Chair Committee. My name is Kate Sukumel, and I am with Minnesota Alliance with Youth. Um, and I came today to speak in support of, and thank you for including Senate File 194, Senator Swedinski's uh, Minnesota Council on Youth. Um, the establishment of a Minnesota Youth Advisory Council will provide numerous opportunity for students to testify, shape policy, and work with you all, decision makers at all levels. It would enhance transparency and accountability with those we elect and expand access for young people to take part in leadership and decision making. Um, and since I'm not as youthful as I used to be, I wanted to read uh, a letter from one of our former youth council participants, Hafsa. Some of you might have known Hafsa from her many times testifying at the Capitol. She says, there's no better way to learn about democracy and the systems we use to govern our society than to be part of that process. I served on the Minnesota Youth Council during my junior and senior year of high school, and it was a transformative experience. I applied for the Youth Council because I was interested in government and community service, and I came out of the council as an empowered citizen of my state with the tools, understanding, and passion for affecting change through legislation and democracy. A Minnesota Youth Advisory Council is necessary. Young people are passionate, engaged, and knowledgeable members of society. No one knows the needs of young people more than young people themselves. If we want to talk about creating the best possible state for young people to grow up, grow up in, it starts with their representation in discussions and decisions being made about them. For example, during my time on the council, I served on the Governor's Children's Advi Cabinet Advisory Council as a liaison between the two councils. At one of our meetings, I vividly remember discussions about students' experiences with me mental health support in schools. The advisory council members made of adults turned to me to get a deeper understanding of the student experience. To this day, I wonder what the group would have done or recommended to the governor as a student, if a student's voice had not been there. Furthermore, even though I was in the room, my words only encompassed my own experiences. We also need students from a metro school, a rural school, charter, private, et cetera to most accurately understand students' experiences with mental health in schools. 
This is only one example of why representation of young people in our government is crucial. Thank you, members. Thank you for supporting and including this bill. Thank you so much for your testimony. Um, on deck will be Mr. Maz, and uh, now Mr. Raines, if you could state your name for the record. Absolutely, uh, Chair and members. My name's Phil Raines. I'm here representing the Minnesota Society for Professional Surveyors. Uh, I want to thank you for including Senate File 1659 by uh, Senator Carlson. Uh, this is a really important bill. Uh, it, I think to uh, Chair Murphy's point, uh, this is a fix it up bill and when you do a fix it up on a house or something else, sometimes you pull apart uh, some pieces and find some rod underneath and uh, some important things that we have to fix. This is the section corners that lay out the basic map of the state. They're the original thing laid out by the government land office when, uh, whenever the U.S. expanded to the west. Uh, and so these were basically pieces of wood that were put in the ground, laid out the section corners, uh, and this is the basis of all our property maps. Uh, unfortunately, we've had about 150 years of uh, decay in this system. Uh, those sticks in the ground are great, uh, but we do need to modernize. What we're asking for is a system that we come in and we re-monument. Uh, putting in some modern uh, metal poles along with a medallion on the top that's magnetic and we can find it again and uh, then lock that into our GIS and GPS systems so that uh, this is actually technologically up to date, allows more development into the future. So really appreciate it. There's $22 million in there for this by any only and uh, this is a vital vital project uh, to, to bring us up into the modern system. So appreciate that today. Thank you so much for your testimony. And last on the list is Mr. Moss with Ramsey County. If you could please state your name for the record. Certainly. Good morning, Madam Chair, Chair Murphy, members of the committee. My name is Jeffrey Moss. I am Senior Geospatial Business Analyst with Ramsey County's Information Services. I'm also affiliate faculty at the Humphrey School of Public Affairs, University of Minnesota. And I'm here to testify and express our gratitude for the inclusion of SS 1659 into the Omnibus Bill uh, for funding to be directed to the remonumentation of the public land survey system in our state. Uh, the funding as proposed will support the maintenance of an important and yet often forgotten form of infrastructure that undergirds and defines significant aspects of our society, our relationship to and use of land and our statewide economy. In my profession, that of urban planning and working with geographic information systems, we deal extensively with geospatial digital data that represents parcels of real estate, roadways, land use designations, zoning districts, administrative boundaries, and other features of both the built and the natural environment. Uh, the digital data that we create and maintain to conduct the work of government traces its origin to and is dependent upon the accuracy of the statewide grid of monuments the proposal at hand is intended to refresh and to maintain. Accurate data and measurements of land boundaries supported by a well-maintained public land survey system underlie and serve a wide range of activities including real estate transactions, adjudication of property boundary disputes, natural resource management, land value assessment, property tax collection, maintenance of easements and rights of way to name just a few. Having a well-maintained and dependable grid of monumentation of this kind ensures the creation and maintenance of digit accurate digital data needed for natural resource protection, secure and accurate real estate transactions, accuracy and clarity for legal activity related to land, and supports the continued provision of land available for development, for forestry, for agriculture, for recreation, and all other public and private activity which rely on the system. The proposed investment by the state will provide for the uh, public land survey system. Remonumentation will extend its lifespan and be of enormous continuous value to the body of public and private professionals that rely on it. In providing this funding, Minnesota can, as it so often does, set an example for other states in maintaining this type of infrastructure uh, for the benefit of its current and future generations. On behalf of the urban planning and geospatial professional community in our state who work closely with our colleagues in land survey, uh, reiterate my gratitude for your funding of this uh, provision. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. At this time, is there anyone else who had wanted to testify who has not been given the opportunity? Okay, thank you. Members, uh, we will be discussing the bill itself and amendments at a later date, but at this time, do you have any questions for the testifiers? Senator McQuaid. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, this actually might not be for 
the testifiers, it might be for um, Senator Murphy. I just had a really quick question, and it might have been something that I missed before I came in. I'm looking on page 45. Um, and I'm just looking at some of the new uh, safeguards we put in about grants, and I'm just reading um, 45.26. A grant agreement must, by its terms, permit the commissioner to unilaterally terminate the grant agreement <clears throat> if the commissioner determines that further performance under the grant would not serve the agency purposes. My two questions are, um, do we have to go back to current grants that have been agreed to and put this language in, or is it going forward? Senator Murphy. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for the question. And I'm going to uh, see if the commissioner is still here or someone from the Department of Administration um, to make sure that we can talk about how they would administer this provision. Uh, I think everybody uh, understands why it is important and why it's here. Good morning. Thank you. If you could please state your name and title for the record. Thank you, Madam Chair. Julie Byrell from the Department of Administration. Sir McQuaid, this would apply to grants going forward, I believe. It's effective July 1, I, I think. Do you have a follow-up? Go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. And then um, if we're, and when we're talking about the commissioner here, it's the commissioner of the Department of Administration and not all commissioners. Is that correct? Madam Chair, that's correct. It would be the commissioner of administration. Senator McWade. Thank you, Madam Chair. Those are my only two questions. Thank you. Were there any other questions from any of the members over the testimony? Okay. With that said, I will be laying the bill on the table. Madam Chair, so quite, how about comments? Are we doing comments or are we laying on the table or are we? So the intention is to, today was testimony. Um, the actual debate of the bill was going to happen on Monday with amendments and hopefully the passing of the bill. If there's something you'd like to address now, I'd be happy to. No, sorry, I'll wait till Monday. Thank you, Madam Chair. We're good? Okay. So with that, I will lay the bill on the table and we will reconvene on Monday, April 3rd at 10 a.m. for markup, discussion, and questions related to this bill and passage. Thank you, Senator Murphy. I adjourn the meeting. <laughs>